And the session I moderated was looking at a um, combination of um, uh, primarily focused on technology, but also we, we um, heard about gathering information from um, underserved populations as well. And <clears throat> so I'm actually gonna start with my second and third bullet points. And one of the things that was exciting about the application of <clears throat> these technologies, especially using artificial intelligence, was that um, in chronic diseases, we've heard from many speakers, the pathogenesis is not well understood. And so this is a place where using the tools of artificial intelligence can actually help. Since you have a large array of, of data that's hard to process, that that's really what um, AI is, is meant to help with. And then also, as we heard from a number of speakers, <clears throat> there's a low financial incentive to uh, cure the chronic diseases as well. And so uh, what people are trying to do with artificial intelligence is to save money and time in the development process. So that's also a good fit. So if you look at where AI can be applied, <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of uncertainty from the beginning um, all the way through the all the way through the drug development process. And so um, it's great that there's the opportunity to to have an impact um, across across the spectrum. Then um, one of the things, if we go to the next slide, one of the things that artificial intelligence needs is obviously data. And <clears throat> one of the things we heard is that uh, we heard a great presentation about the brain initiative and the wide variety of tools are developing and data they're generating. And what's what was interesting to hear was that <clears throat> the AI algorithms just like data. <laughs> so the, the notion that the data has to somehow be targeted towards um, a certain expected outcome isn't, isn't really necessary. In fact, in some ways, it's almost better if it's just data that's coming um, in more of an orthogonal or just um, in a um, separate kind of way that the algorithms can, can take this new information and see how it compares to everything else that they're, they're processing. Um, then the next slide, um, we also, as I mentioned, heard about the wide variety, <clears throat> um, as Susan touched on as well, uh, the wide variety in patients. And so um, this is also another source, obviously, of, of um, being able to provide more data and, and input into uh, developing the drug development process. And then if we go on to the next slide, um, Chi told us about some of the exciting work that's going on at the FDA. And unlike what I said about the Brain Initiative, where Andrew Radin, who's um, developing AI tools, um, you know, said again that he just likes data. Um, one of the things that was interesting about what the FDA is doing, and this is focusing on some of the preclinical things, um, the ADME process, um, is that when they see gaps, they're going and looking to figure out, well, how can we develop um, tools, whether um, in this case, a lot of them in vitro tools, that we can generate better data. And then how do we combine that with some modeling um, to help guide the, the drug development process? And so it was sort of nice to see the, the back and forth between um, being able to process and develop models as well as going and generating technology. And there are, there are a lot of companies working in the AI area across that spectrum of the drug development process. And some of them are proactively going and, and generating data that they think will be helpful to them uh, using their algorithms to, to increase knowledge. Then um, overall, we did see some, some challenges. Um, so this is all very exciting, but of course there's always challenges. And some of the, those nuts and bolts challenges is um, just very simple things like the format, formatting and sharing of data. So, um, you know, John, when he was talking about the brain initiative, he said, well, yeah, we're generating all this data, but it's really hard to figure out how to, how to get it in a format that people can use. And then also just sharing of the data. How do you, uh, it's, how do you um, make people aware of it? How do you get it somewhere where people can access it? And then um, we also heard about, um, you know, the privacy issues, especially around the patient population. So it's great that there are um, people like Erica going out and doing work with indigenous populations, but then there's issues about, well, if you have too small of a group you're looking at, their, their information can um, be too closely associated perhaps with, 
with that population and um, you know whether there's certain disease or, or privacy issues around that. And um, as we just heard from Susan and from Erica, you know there are these vast numbers of subpopulations. So just the amount of effort to go and interact with all these different groups and generate that data um, is also an issue as well as when you look at the scientific data, obviously there's a wide range of things beyond just ADME and, and understanding the brain where, where more data can be generated. So overall, I came away um, very excited about the potential and very excited about the progress that is being made, and especially across um, a lot of organizations. So the regulators, um, the NIH with more basic research, uh, companies that are looking to actually take um, novel techniques to push forward the drug development process, and um, clearly seems like there's, there's a lot of potential to have an impact on some of the diseases we've been talking about. So with that, I will turn it back to um, Carl to move us along. Okay.